presentation. And with that, we'll start out with roll call. Hey, Representative Allred? Here. Representative Andrew? Here. Representative Berger? Here. Representative Brown? Here. Representative Clauston? Here. Representative Lawley? She's probably here, but she's going to be late. Representative Obermuller? Here. Representative Provenza? Same. She's mm -hmm. probably here, but she's late. And she's, yeah. And Chairman Northrop. Here. Right, Mr. Chairman, she's got a bill in court. She has a bill in court, so she'll be here when she finishes up. Thank you. All right. We finished up on 176. We were taking public comment from everybody out of town, and it was left that we would take public comment on 176 K-12 education standards and assessments from anybody else that wished to because we were pushing the time pretty hard. So any more public comment on 176? Please have a seat. Fill them up, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Janine Bateski from Teton County. We certainly support the concept of the bill. I think that um, I've been having discussions behind the scenes, as you well know, on this very topic to try and see, you know, what can we do to take some of the burden off our educators and our school districts? The, the, the million dollar question is, how do you thread the needle to put enough stretch into the system so people really reduce and don't try and take and play the, the game and, you know, stuff standards under one and call it, take three standards and put it under one and call it one. Um, but I think that this is a really, really important piece of work. As I've really been reflecting on it, to me, this is something that really, I think, needs to come forward uh, as one of your interim topics. There's a lot of work going on with the state board, and I think it would really behoove us all if um, this came forward during the interim as well to try and figure out how do we accelerate this and how do we keep it on stream so that we really do make reductions. So I thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. I'm sorry, Chairman Brown. Oh, I'm not Chairman in here, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman. Janine, <laughs> um, curious on whether or not the state board has worked in consultation with any of the other boards that you're aware of. And I, I spoke briefly with a couple of the um, people on the board, but just out of curiosity, if, the, if there have been those discussions and what those have looked like right now with the current process. Go ahead, Janine. Mr. Chair, Representative Brown, I'm not sure I can totally answer it. I will say that, you know, you've got to back up a step <clears throat> and understand that this is an offshoot from profile of a graduate. In saying that, there were sessions all around the state. In fact, they came to my district twice. So I think the answer to your question is yes. Um, and then you heard from so many of the, several of the teachers, and I, I think it's great that they're picking the best of the best to be, you know, in their audit committees and so on and so forth. So I think the answer is yes, they're reaching out. I think there needs to be perhaps more reach out or if it isn't reach out, it's probably better communication as to the status of where they are and where they're going. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for Janine? Thank you, Janine. Please go ahead and state your name for the record. Mr. Chairman, Bill Winnie, Sublet County. The other day, in introducing the bill, Speaker Harshman, former speaker, I guess I should say, called it the Save the Elementary Teacher Bill and that you needed to put sideboards on standards. I'd like to expand on that thinking. I happen to agree with that. Uh, standards can get in the way. They really can. And if there's somebody that understands how standards might get in the way, I would offer you that a guy like me that operated nuclear submarines for 30 years understands things like standards. But the real issue, and Speaker Harshman brought up, was why should we shorten, minimize, streamline the standards? And I would offer you the thought that it's because teachers are professionals. That's my observation. I observed my wife teach as I moved, she and I moved around in uh, my time on active duty in the Navy. She taught in a number of school systems. 
And, you know, there's a lot of skills the teacher has. It's not just the issue of knowledge of the subject like math or whatever. It's things like classroom control. How do you make sure that kid over there who doesn't yet get it gets it and that kid over there that got it two weeks ago isn't bored? And there's skills that go with that in the classroom all the time. If you uh, look at how we do business in the Navy, particularly in the nuclear world, you get good people, you train them upright, and you get out of their way. And that is how you get the most productivity. They had a bill the other day in the other body uh, having to do with a study of K through 12. Uh, and I spoke up in a similar vein. I'm not going to talk about that bill, but I spoke up in the, the theme I'm going to talk today. Um, you all had a teacher in the interim, in one of your interim committee meetings that spoke up and said they just wanted to be respected, made the newspapers. Um, I've observed the committees here over the years, and you're kind of on a treadmill with studies. You do a study and a study and a study, and it's a hundred thousand bucks and another hundred and a, so on down the line. But I never saw any of those studies get back to that basic thought of teachers as professionals. I had a couple con uh, conversations that I think are, are important. Uh, I, over in the Jonah building, I spoke with a uh, uh, chairman of, of a school board, and I happened to mention that comment about teachers are professionals. And the response of that chairman was, they're not professionals, they're just teachers. After I picked my jaw up off the floor, we continued the conversation. A uh, chairman of the, of, uh, of the, the House Education Committee some years ago, I mentioned that word professionals and his, his uh, comeback was, that comes up when they just want more money. Well, I think the thing you're dealing with is you put money into studies and into superintendents. We have some of them out there getting a lot of money uh, every year. But the more money you put into those kind of things, the more blue collar you make the front of the classroom. And the more blue collar it becomes, the, the more you want to do more studies. And so I would offer you the thought as you, as you work through this bill and the issue of standards and hopefully reducing them, is you, you talk about, well, how do we change the culture of Wyoming education where teachers are treated as professionals? And that's a pretty broad statement. I'd have to give you some, some real deep thought about how do you do that? But I think that will get you to where you wanna go, but it'll take a lot of time. Uh, should you have standards? Yeah, you gotta have some. But when you can hammer somebody with the book of standards, maybe that's a bit much. Subject to your questions, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Winnie? Thank you, sir. Department, have anything you'd like to say on this? Anybody else have anything you'd like to say? All right. Representative Harshman, Speaker Harshman, would you like to come up and sit up here and we'll work the bill. We'll close public comment if nobody has anything else to add. Thank you. Okay, we're on House Bill 176, K-12 Education Standards and Assessment. Committee, anything on the front? Oh, first off. Mr. Chairman, I'll move the bill. Thank you. There you go. Moved by Brown, seconded by Clauston. Okay, anything? I guess I'm going to turn it out, Representative Harshman, because we kind of pushed you up and rushed you pretty hard. Would you like to... Say anything on the bill before we start seeing if there's an amendment on it. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your uh, kindness and, and holding that for me to come back and had to do another bill on another committee and uh, appreciate everybody's interest in this. And I think really, I just think, uh, you know, the parts to this one is the standards. The other part is the testing and reporting back to you. And I think, um, I would just say again, the state board is a creation of the legislature. It's a beautiful thing. I've always supported the state board. I've supported full funding. I supported 
any way I can, and I will always do that, and I know this legislature will. And I'll just say, we didn't get to 1900 standards with this board. I mean, this has been several boards, and it's been an ongoing, just, it's our society, right? And it's by very well-meaning professionals. And and I, I don't think this board will fully solve this issue. It's gonna keep going on for at least another nine years if this bill passes, and it'll, and then boards will come and go. We'll pretty soon be guys on the wall that nobody will remember. And I think, um, where are the sideboards on this? And that's really my issue because boards come and go. And I just think um, uh, we've had some experience now, nearly two decades, um, mm -hmm. and we've gone too far. And I think uh, everybody recognized that. The state board recognized that. The department, certainly our teachers uh, in the classrooms. I think it's really important we all row the boat in the same direction. We're all united on this thing. And uh, so I'm not trying to, with this bill, take the legislature and put them in another boat and row in a different direction to a different destination. We're all headed to the destination, uh, the same destination, which is to keep Wyoming number one in the nation is in K-12 education like we currently are. and. Um, and so I just don't want us to just do this to ourselves like we've done. And so trying to back us off. And, and so that's part of that. And then I think this piece with the testing, we've had to back off the K2 testing, which this committee supported a few years ago. I think we look at, do we need to do those additional tests in high school that are not required? Do we need to do that? And I think that's conversations for this committee. And this bill, you know, promotes that in the, in the second section of this. And if you haven't yet, maybe I'll just send you the link to that fourth grade English language arts Y top test. And uh, over the weekend when we're snowed in, we can take a look. But uh, again, if that number, if you think, you know, if we get feedback from folks that say, hey, that number is too prescriptive for and per grade level in the, in the three R's, I'll call it. If that, it should be eight or it should be six, but, uh, Whatever it is, it shouldn't be 220 standards for a first grade teacher. Right. And so I think sideboards are a good thing, and that's what we do here. And so, Mr. Chairman, members really appreciate your thoughtfulness. You're a nice committee and appreciate the work you're going to do uh, for our kids and our schools and, our, and everybody, really, uh, for our state. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions, I'd be happy to Any questions for Representative Harshman? Well, it was pointed out that I forgot that Ryan Fuhrman is out there on, is he on Zoom? Yes. Did he raise his hand when we asked for public comment? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, committee. It's been moved and seconded that we look at the bill. Any questions or any comments or amendments? Go ahead, Representative Berger. I just have a comment. and I really like this bill. I looked at it, had more time to do discuss with uh, Mr. Chairman, discuss with uh, the good representative from Casper. And uh, I really like this bill. And one thing that it does, it doesn't tell the board and tell teachers what standards to take out. It guides them and we're the ones deciding that. Okay? And all the professionals and the teachers and these boards we're going to bring it together because we're going to push this thing forward together. We're all going to jump in that same boat. I don't like it. On and for this bill. All right. Anybody else have anything you'd like to say? Go ahead. Yep. Um, let's work the amendments before we continue more comments. Have an amendment? Have an amendment. He's, he's just thinking about bringing an amendment. So. <laughs> Sneaky like so, that, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I, anything on page one as we work through the bill? Okay, anything on page two, committee? That's the meat of the bill. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Um, I'll start with page two, line four, after standards, insert, and indicators. And on the second, I'll explain. I'll second it. Moon seconded that we, that we insert indicators on line four of page two after standards. 
Mr. Chairman, the reason I'm adding this and indicators, um, I, I'm not sure. I did have the first bill up on Committee of the Whole, so I wasn't able to hear the testimony, but I did have a constituent that brought this forward that this particular idea that we may shorten and condense standards, but underneath those standards, we have all these indicators. And if we just shorten the standards, but we open up everything else underneath there for the indicators to be recognized, um, I think it's important, and I'll have some more amendments as we go along, um, that, that kind of direct what we're trying to do here. But what I don't want to see is um, us unload in one area and load up on another. So that's the intent behind this particular portion. And then I'll go over the rest of the amendment that I have. Okay, this. so we have an amendment to add indicators after standards. Comments? Not appearing, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. Mr. Chairman, go further amendments. Go ahead. All right. I will move um, on page two, line 10. After the word standards, insert with no more than current indicators on record. And then, Mr. Chairman, I would also add that same exact language on line 14 after the word standard. And then also on line 19 after the word standards. And again, that would read for grades kindergarten through six, not more than four content standards with no more than current indicators on record for one grade level shall be adopted. Pretty good. Second? Yes. Been moved and seconded. Moved by Brown, seconded by Allred. Any discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chairman, you heard my explanation of exactly what we're looking for. I think what we don't want to do is set this up for failure. I like the idea and the, the impetus behind this bill. Um, it's not perfect right now, but this is what we do in committee is do the work and try to make it better. Excellent. Any other comments? Not appearing, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, we're on page three. Any amendments? He shakes his head no. Okay, page four. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I do believe um, I will move one last amendment, and that would be on page four, line seven. Strike 2023 and insert 2024. Wait for a second. Wait for a second. Yes. Maybe. Seconded Maybe. by all red. Mr. Right. Chairman, thank you. I think. <laughs> yes, it was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Move by Brown, second by here. all red. Mr. Chairman, um, just based off of how quickly August 1st, 2023 really comes into play, I think it's a, a smart process for us to make sure that mm. we give the board ample time, ample opportunity to do what they need to do. This is a big lift, and, and making sure that this gets done right. Um, I think we go push this out for a year, and, and by this time next year, if we run into issues, we can also come back and address it again. So, any other comments? None appearing. We'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of the amendment of adding twenty four and striking twenty three, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. That amendment has also passed. Now, comments on the bill. If oh wait, is there any more? We got one more page. Page five. Mr. Chairman, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No comments or no more amendments, then we'll move to comments. Comments on the bill. Representative Clawson. Thank you. you. You know, I tried to move this the other day before the good chairman could come back. <laughs> you called the timeout on me before the last play. but. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you, Representative Brown. Uh, this is a better bill with what you did. I think this bill puts a spotlight on something we all know in the state that's a problem, the standards. Uh, for the last few years of being on the state board, this is something we worked on. I think this bill gives the wrong message, though. You know, our, our state board and our department have been working really hard with our teachers. Uh, they're moving faster than probably even what this bill does. And I think this bill says, thanks for the work, but... To me, it doesn't really respect all the hard work that's been done. Um, it does put a spotlight on the problem, though, and I think it does put a spotlight on the state board and the department that if we don't see this great pace keeping up, that this bill is going to come back. 
I would like the state board and the department to keep up the great work that they're doing and just be aware that if things slow or the public and our teachers aren't happy that this bill is going to come back and it might not be this good of a bill. So I'm going to vote no on this bill, um, but we all know this is an issue that we're going to keep our eye on. Thank you. Other comments on the bill? Not appearing and sensing your urgency and wanting Question. to vote. Thank you. We'll proceed to vote. Call the roll, please. Okay. Representative Allred? No. Representative Andrew? Aye. Representative Berger? Aye. Representative Brown? Aye. Representative Clauston? No. Representative Lawley? We're on House Bill 176. As amended. As amended. No. Representative Obermuller? No. Representative Provenza? Aye. Chairman Northrop? Aye. Five ayes and four noes. All right. Thank you. All right, we're going to quickly move to House Bill 137. I understand we have a few people in the Zoom world who would like to comment on it. So, and we also have, I believe, Sandy Newsom, the bringer of the bill. Could you bring her in, please? Pretty unusual to allow a legislator to come in by Zoom, but everybody knows that Sandy's got a broken leg and she's crippled up. So temporarily she'll be here in just a minute Representative Newsom, I'm not sure if you're getting the dialogue to agree to join as a panelist. There we go. Okay, you're in the room, so if you just wanna unmute. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Would you like to work your bill? I would. Um, thank you for allowing me to um, join this way, Chairman Northrup. And Another thank you to uh, Representative Brown for presenting a bill um, in the Minerals Committee for me earlier today. Um, House Bill 137 was brought to me by a Park County School trustee and the Cody High School Youth for Justice group. They were concerned about several students had been, who had been taken to the hospital after using Delta-8, which is a CBD-derived product. In 2012, the legislature made um, the sale of spice a similar sort of um, drug illegal, and yet we've seen more and more of these products being created that are equally as harmful. In 2019, the legislature voted to make hemp the legal use of hemp in Wyoming. The goal of this bill is to get away from creating the whack-a-mole theory of when this um, particular product pops up, we'll squash it down, and when this another particular product um, pops up, we'll squash it down. So we're, we seem to always be one step behind the creators of these products. So what this bill does is it makes the age be 21 to be able to purchase all CBD products except for topical applications. Um, so the lotions and things that, that have CBD in them would not, that with this bill would not be applicable. And as we walk through the bill, um, pages two through five detail the penalties for selling CBD products to anyone who is younger than 21 years of age. And this creates a new statute, 143310, that makes the sale of products to persons under age 21 and the penalties for those things. And then as you look through the bill, trying to screen on my, scroll on my tiny screen, um, it's $250 for a first violation and then 500 for a second, and then 750 for a third violation, regardless of the locations where the violation occurs. So this puts the onus on the retailer, much like liquor stores and cigarette stores, 
to make sure that anyone purchasing products from them are 21. And then we go down to um, pages um, five through I think eight. And this, this is the penalty for the people that are trying to purchase it or that attempt to purchase CBD products that are under 21. And if they misrepresent their identity or age, similar to liquor and similar to cigarettes. The, the difference here is um, that we make the citation expungible um, if, if they comply with all of the uh, court, uh, court derived penalties for them. So within nine months, the um, court can expunge a conviction of possession. And then going down the bill to page eight, then we, we further define um, hemp and CD, CBD products. Currently in our statutes in 1151-102 on page seven, it states that notwithstanding the requirements of this chapter, the possession, purchase, sale, transfer, transportation, and use of hemp products by any person is allowable. Currently it says without restriction. So what we're adding here is that we're gonna provide these restrictions that are provided in 143310 and 143311 um, that don't allow the sale of these products to persons under 21. And then at the bottom of page eight, we um, define CBD products as any part seed variety or product of the can cannabis stativa L, whether growing or not, and product derivatives extract derivative extract and cannab cannab cannabinoid. And so this just goes on to, to define what CBD products are and reiterating that it's less than um, three tenths of 1% as is in our hemp statutes. And then we go on to define what THC means. And then um, down on page nine, we define the possession of hemp or hemp products for any purpose except for these two new cre newly created statutes. And then the effective date of July 1, 2023. So I stand for any questions. Thank you, Representative Newsom. Chairman Newsom, we have a question from Representative Clauston. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Newsom, so nice to see you. So great, <laughs> great to see you. Just uh, a point of clarification here. So, you know, I've, I've had several people reach out to me. Their children are using uh, gummy bears with CBD and it helps with their seizures and epilepsy and that kind of thing. D does this bill refer to only the Delta 8 products or would this bill limit them from being able to use those other CBD products with their children? Go ahead, Representative Newsom. Um, that's a great question, Representative. I... I don't know the answer to that, but we should find out. I believe that is addressed in a separate section, the, the use of um, the specific products for epilepsy. I think that's such a narrow scope that I'm not sure where that interacts with this, but we should find out and, and possibly amend this so that it doesn't affect those folks that are um, using those products specific for epilepsy. Okay. Further questions for Representative Newsom, Chairman Newsom? Go ahead, Representative Provenza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again, Representative Newsom. Um, hopefully we'll see you in person soon. Um, I So in my other committee, Judiciary, we've had a lot of conversation about juvenile justice and getting uh, youth involved in the justice system. And so part of my concern with this bill is that 14-3-311, is that, um, when we're basically, we're, we're making it citation. So I appreciate the language for shall be issued a citation rather than being arrested. I think that's certainly a positive thing. Um, I'm wondering though, Part of my concern is like the it can this be used for um, if a youth is already on probation for something else um, or potentially can this be stacked up to have a negative effect where we're maybe having kids get involved with the justice system for um, this substance use and so if I were to try and kind of like take some of the the 
I don't want to say it's criminalizing because it's under 14 instead of under Title VI, but um, if we were to remove some of those penalties for youth, would you be, would that just fly in the face of what you're trying to do or would that be okay? Um, Go ahead, Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Representative Provenza. I, I believe that there are penalties for underage drinking and, and underage use of cigarettes. And this is where this falls in line. And so I think that, it, you know, if we were to amend that to make it maybe less severe, that would be fine. But to take out any penalty altogether for someone trying to purchase or um, attempting to purchase, I think that that is kind of part of the point of this is to say, you know, this is the seller should not sell and the buyer should not try to buy if they don't meet the requirements of being 21. Any other questions for Representative Newsom? Okay, we'll go to public comment. Anybody here would like to comment? Go ahead. Please come up, fill the chairs up so we can go through them. We have lots of people online who would like to comment, so. And Mr. Chairman, while they get set up, if it's okay with you, I'm going to leave Representative Newsom in the room just Excellent. in case anything comes up. That'd be great. Sure. So state your name and tell us your comment. Oh, we should go to the department first. I'm sorry. Please go ahead, please, department. Good afternoon, Chairman, um, committee members. My name is Stephanie Pyle. I'm the Senior Administrator of the Public Health Division at the Wyoming Department of Health. We have two suggestions for the committee's consideration today, and I will uh, turn this over to my colleague, Rachel Nuss, to walk through those suggestions with the committee. Go ahead, Rachel. Mr. Chairman, committee members, I'm Rachel Ness, and I work at the Department of Health as the Community Prevention Unit Manager. Can you thank pull the mic a little closer? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today. Our agency does have a few minor suggestions for consideration on this bill. The definition is potentially not broad enough to address current issues that we are seeing. In addition, we have a suggestion for the penalty portion of the bill. Mr. Chairman, we do have a copy of the suggested language, if you would like. I can speak more on more in detail on the suggestions as well. Yes, we'd like to hear the detail. Okay. Mr. Chairman, committee members, our suggestion would be to update the definition of THC, which is found on page 9, line 12. After 9, tetrahydrocannabinoid, add or any structural, optical, or geometric isomers of tetrahydrocannabinoid. What broadening this definition would do is encompass hemp-derived CBD that is synthetically converted into products currently on the market like Delta-8 and Delta-10 that are psychoactive with intoxicating effects similar to Delta-9 THC or what we would typically think of as marijuana. This addresses an issue in Wyoming's health, hemp production statute that currently allows these products to be sold to youth. Do you have that in writing? Excellent. Do you know how to yep. spell that? No, <laughs> T-H-A-T. <laughs> yes. I got it all. <laughs> Yes. It's okay. I got I got spelled it right. <laughs> Chairman, do you want me to also share the second amendment? Yes, please. Okay. Mr. Chairman, committee members, we would also like to suggest edits to penalties on page seven, line ten. After perform community service, add or attend a program designed to prevent the onset of substance abuse or cessation program. And then on page seven, line twelve, after for each hour of work perform, add again, or each hour of program designed to prevent the onset of substance abuse or cessation program attended. This type of penalty is similar to what penalties you see in the tobacco, underage tobacco penalties. Um, and it would also allow the court to have youth who are found in violation of purchase or possession of CBD products participate in substance abuse prevention programs or cessation that may be more effective for a given individual than providing community service or um, 
paying a fine. And I bet you have that in writing. Yep. <laughs> Good. And I'll stand for any questions now. Okay. We'll take those into consideration when we get to that point. We appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, and forgive me, but I didn't catch your name. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Representative Rachel Ness. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rachel, with this amendment essentially solve the problem? I mean, if this would expand the definition so that it includes some of these synthetically derived products that seem to be the issue we're trying to address. Would this solve it without the need for any age barrier to um, purchasing natural CBD products? Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Andrew, the, since the amendment defines the definition of just relating to this, I think that all of the age requirements would still align kind of with our definition change. Further, thank you. Follow up, all right? No. Okay. Uh, further questions for the department? Got anything else you'd like to add, subtract, or put in? No, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, sir. All yours. Mr. Chairman, members of the Education Committee, my name is Sean Murphy. I'm here representing myself personally as a, as a parent and um, my nonprofit uh, called the Atlas Fund. And without going into my professional background, which is really the first half of what I wrote there, I'll just summarize it. I was the founder of a company called Hemp Business Journal. We were the go-to publisher in the country on industrial hemp and CBD. We, we wrote the book on it, uh, the market reports. We broke all the stories. I sold the company in 2018, and my son got very sick. Uh, I came dad, got sick. Uh, he has a terminal brain disease. Uh, it's neurodegenerative, and it basically applies to everything that I learned at Hemp Business Journal in terms of the uses of CBD, both for epilepsy as well as as an anti-inflammatory. I, I know this topic extremely well. Like I literally wrote the book on all of this, the CBD report in 2015. So I feel like kind of an old, an old gray weathered hemp person at this point. I've since moved on, moved back to Wyoming, and I'm in the blockchain crypto industry. And some of you see me around um, advocating for parenting rights. But I saw this bill come up. I know a lot about it. And it's misguided. It, it really is. And the first one that is important to understand is it's defining just CBD, cannabidiol. And what this bill would do, just as a visual example, let's say you're a 20-year-old veteran that has a sprained ankle. You cannot go buy under this bill, or you'll be penalized. You'll get a fine if you go buy a CBD topical product like this. Oh, you it's won't. readily available online. Yep, your definition is CBD. So, like, I know this. The other issue is the difference between topical and ingestible. That's not defined, and it's it's said as CBD. But what we really need to be doing is not looking at CBD, but looking at, and this is the term, and it was presented to you, synthetic isomers. That's delta eight. Delta 9, Delta 10, that's available down the street. I, I drove by the store and I could get Delta 8 products readily available here. There's 21 states that have regulated or banned synthetic isomers. That is the term. Uh, a synthetic isomers come from CBD. CBD could be natural. So like these are natural CBD products, right? I don't think we want to be in the business here of fining people, especially somebody who's able to serve for our country you know, from getting a CBD product. What I think we should be doing is protecting people and, and finding bad operators that are selling Delta-8, Delta-9. These, again, the term is synthetic isomers. These get you high, right? Whereas these products, these don't get you high. But the way that I read this bill is we're gonna be finding people that are selling products that don't even get people high. And, and that's just silly. And that just looks really bad. I mean, there's 21 states that have done this right. New York is a great example. And I think we need to, in this bill today and take a much better thoughtful approach. And I think that's done with looking at decrim, medical cannabis, and how we really thoughtfully go about regulating or outright banning these synthetic isomers. Because those are the issues. That's where there's the health risk. That's what we don't want kids having access to. Uh, and, and 
like I, I know that access issue. Like I'm, I'm literally fighting for my child's life in Colorado at Children's Hospital because that follows federal policy with marijuana being a Schedule One drug, and they won't recommend it. So he can't even get a recommendation for CBD because they treat that like marijuana, Schedule One. So these are very technical issues with the definitions and the terms. And the way that I read this is it needs to most immediately be amended to not just be, to not be CBD, but to be synthetic isomers. That's the term that brings in all of these things that are derived from CBD that, that get people high and that can be dangerous for children. So I, I hope that was a, a way for me to explain what's going on here. I think uh, this bill should end and there should be a, a, a much better look at this. And it could be even looking at medical cannabis and decrim and a part of the synthetic isomer topic in as an interim study, which I think should happen. Questions for the presenter? I have one. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Good to see you again. Um, out of curiosity, you know, if we take the information, it's, it's interesting that you and the department have recognized the exact same thing, that it's actually the synthetic isomer that we're, we're, we're needing to go to. If we look at page eight, line 21, that says CBD product means, and we strike CBD product and we insert isomer, you know, synthetic isomer, um, and we try to fix this bill to do exactly what you're saying, as opposed to just killing it, uh, it goes back to what I just said in our previous bill. It's our job as a committee to make bills better. Um, does that make this bill more palatable? Because I agree with you. I don't want to be taking a 20 year old that's able to come back from, you know, basic training and has a wounded knee and potentially get in trouble for something that they have CBD now and they shouldn't be. So is that more palatable to you? And then Mr. Chairman, after that, I, I do have a question for the department as well. Go ahead, Mr. Murphy. Uh, uh, yeah, Representative Brown, Mr. Chairman, it, it's really the only thing that's palatable to me. I think instead of calling it CBD or synthetic isomers, we should just be focused on synthetic isomers, cannabinoid synthetic isomers. Uh, this focus of using CBD is really because I don't think we have the background of knowledge on this to understand that there's many cannabinoids. There's over 128 cannabinoids. So to call it just CBD is really putting a bad ire on CBD when it's really one of the, it is the safest cannabinoid that we know about. You don't get high from it. So to say, start with CBD and then break it down from there is not the approach. It's better to start with what is the real issue? Cannabinoid synthetic isomers. This is what is getting people high and this is the issue. So it, that's really the only way that I would see this working. And, and instead of it just being penalty or fines, I think we should consider there are many states that have just outright banned this. They said, we don't think people should do this. And a lot of these states have good programs, medical programs, decrim programs that allow people access. Like, I, I don't know if it's good that just anybody can go down the street and buy something that gets them high. I'm not sure that's what we're about in Wyoming. I think we should have a much better medical program where if you're somebody that needs that, you should have access to that. So th th there's, see how it kind of compounds quickly into the larger decrim, the decrim medical issue. But yes, to put it simply, I would change CBD to cannabinoids and make sure that the definition is synthetic isomers of, of cannabinoids. And I would be clear that that get you high, that are psychotropic, that, that, that is what we should be protecting people from. To be protecting somebody from a cannabinoid that does not get them high or does not have any health risk, it, it just, it just, it just, it's not. Okay, uh, Representative Provenza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned New York. Do you have, happen by chance, have their definition, um, how they did that? Or can you kind of give maybe more specifics as to how New York's law is different than, I think this one, um, if I remember correctly, some folks said it was based on kind of what Montana has done and other states. Go ahead, Mr. Murphy. Yeah, I don't have New York's handy. And before I came in, I reached out to um, the team at US Hemp Authority, which is really kind of the top national group in a lot of this. And it's just because I've been out of the game for three or four years as a parent and coming back to Wyoming in the blockchain yeah. industry, I, I had to say, hey, you know, who's doing this right with the synthetic isomers and they directed me to New York. Uh, I, I could go through and look at that and kind of do an analysis. That's the type of stuff we did. Uh, but just off the cuff, uh, she said that um, 
it was New York and that it's because it was more comprehensive. It looked at regulations and bans, not, not just of the retail product, but how their whole industry was operating, the processing, the sale, um, you know, analysis, labs, like it was, it was comprehensive. Further questions for Mr. Murphy? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Rep. Sam Brown. I actually have a question for the department if I could. All right. We have the department back up. Any more questions for Mr. Murphy? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Rachel, is, it, is that right? Um, I'm just curious. So you specifically would like this language because you guys recognize that is primarily the, the main issue that we have with health issues. Um, is there any disconnect between what Mr. Murphy just mentioned and what you guys are seeing as a public health issue um, and CBD? It, it, does Mr. Murphy's story align with what you guys are seeing in the epidemiology of what's going on? Go ahead, Rachel. Mr. Chairman, Representative Bram, um, yet the change that he suggested changing the word CBD product to synthetic isomer products we believe would be acceptable, but of course we would want to make sure that we had the time to review the, how that change would affect. What we do know is that most CBD products on the market are not necessarily approved by the FDA. So there would still there is still is a, a concern there beyond just the isometric. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead and follow up. So my, my thought on this, and I, I'm <clears throat> trying to wrap my head around whether or not I'm interested in going this way. Do you guys have um, statistic analysis on if we take this down to 21 or take this up to 21 versus what we do with alcohol and tobacco, um, what the type of prosecutions there are or citations issued to those that are underage. Um, do you guys have that information? Because what I'm concerned about is doing exactly what we just heard from Mr. Murphy, that we make makes us a penalty uh, for a 20 year old that goes and purchases CBD. Uh, that's really not the intent of what we're trying to do. Um, so do you guys have any of that statistical analysis for us? Either of you, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, if we could have a little bit of time to look into that, I think that would be helpful, and we'll get back to you. Thank you. You're welcome. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for the department from anybody on the committee? Thank you again. All right. We'll open it up to public comment. And I know there's a lot on Zoom that want to comment, so... Does anybody in the audience want to comment on this before we go to Zoom? Please do, Brian. Anybody else want to publicly comment that's in the audience? All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, Byron Ode, Governor, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs of Police, rising in support of the bill slash concept. In the discussion that we're having today. We have two SROs online, I believe, um, a sergeant from Casper uh, and an officer from Gillette, uh, who are prepared to talk about the problems that they're having in the schools with the tetrahydrocannabinoid Delta series infused into several products and the issue of people, quote, greening out in class, passing out and being removed from class in a passed out state, which is part of the impetus for the bill, part of why the Youth for Justice kids out of Cody were here last week talking about the necessity for the bill. So, Mr. Chairman, whether you would like me to do my comments and then hear from them, or... Yes, let's hear your comments and we'll hear directly from them. Okay, thank you. So, I don't, I don't want to steal their thunder, so I may uh, shorten mine in anticipation of being there, hoping that they were able to Hit the testify button and if not i'll i'll come back if you allow to to pick up where they do or don't leave off so part of the bill <coughs> contemplates the idea of cbd products under the age of 21 as we talked about the same as alcohol and tobacco it would not be uh, the the issue that we have is with those other forms if you will not the top topolo topological cream uh, the the more uh, medical side of a CBD product, recognizing that in the purest form of the definition, CBD products are legal. It's a hemp-derived product. It's legal. 0.03 and below 
is unrestricted. That's part of where that language comes from, is unrestricted. So this is a restriction, item one, on that. So we need to be a little careful about that, I agree, and focus on that which is a problem, so to speak. And I think your general direction of trying to narrow it to that which the not so reputable folks are taking some of the legal CBD slash hemp related product, synthesizing it and synthesizing out that 0 0.03 THC into a higher product and trying to market that as a legal product. When in fact it's a THC derived product. So Mr. Chairman, I think that's the issue that we face and bring for education is the issues we're facing now with that derived product with the tetrahydrocannabinoid uh, that's being infused in gummy bears, Fruit Loops, Captain Munch cereal, um, all of the th lollipops, gummy bears, all of the things that the industry said they would not do when we did the hemp brill, they're doing. And here we are. If we'd have stuck to the game of what's legal's legal and what's not's not, we wouldn't be having a discussion of now what they're doing and do we want to continue with that which they're doing of the tetrahydrocannabinoid, which I like the definition of including the structural optical uh, geometric isomers of the tetrahydrocannabinoid oil, uh, because if you in the reference was to spice and for those that were in the legislature for some time ago, every year we came back with another one page definition of a new isomer that started off and nobody pronounced those on the floor either referenced it and passed it till next year when we came back with another. Well, in the tetrahydrocannabinoid world, that's Delta 9, Delta 10, Delta 11. I'm sure if we outlawed those, we'll have Delta 12 and 13 coming next. So keeping that definition in order, if you will, uh, would help tremendously. So back to the point. So CBD uh, in the forms that we find them is the issue of discussion for why we would want to do something under the age of 21 for those products without interfering with that parental guidance or those legal products that are clearly 0 0.03 unrestricted products. So if we can craft and narrow the discussion to that which is causing us problems and allow the parents to continue parenting would be good. Mr. Chairman, and as I said, there are several uh, officers ready to point out should you need examples of the issues they're finding in the schools for what prompted the discussion with the bill. Representative Provenza has a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Odekoven, I'm trying to think of like enforcement. And so if we get down to, we have tetra type of blah, 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 12 and 13 and 65 and whatever, do we have any mechanisms to test the difference between what we have as CBD um, as a whole versus like the different, the isonomers. Thank you. Go ahead, Byron. Mr. Chairman, at the risk of going out over the pier and standing on the plank, uh, let me tackle part of that question without the Division of Criminal Investigation and a lab expert sitting beside me. So the dilemma that we have is THC in its form, we can test for. We can determine it as there, not that we can do a good job with the percentages. That's the tricky part. That was part of the issue with the uh, hemp related products at 0 0.03. The lab tests don't get to 0 0.03. So we're relying on labs who claim they do it. And at last report, I believe the testimony before the judiciary two years ago was the prominent lab in Colorado was plus or minus 50% in terms of their accuracy plus or minus 50%. So when you look on the Captain Munch box and you see that the level of Delta-9 cannabinoid is 0.27, yes. oh wait, that would be point less than 0.3, so therefore it's 0 0.027 uh, is suspect at best. So do we have that ability to test? Not very well. The dilemma that we have is any THC in the product is illegal the THC side of the house, and with the synthetics and the tetrahydrocannabinoids, now you have me doing it, I apologize, mm -hmm. tetrahydrocannabinoids, 
uh, the THC found in them is the illegal side of the of the discussion and the equation. So, Mr. Chairman, further questions for Brian? Go ahead, Representative Brown. Just to follow up on that question, Mr. Chairman, is can we detect whether or not it's synthetic or not? Go ahead, Brian. Mr. Chairman, that's one I better not well, step out on the limb okay. for. Okay. So, you have a, any other questions? You have a couple people on. On Zoom, I know you have um, Sarah Nelson, who's from Casper. Sergeant from the Casper Police Department. <laughs> okay. yeah. Great. It is loading. Ms. Nelson, you are in the room. If you want to unmute and turn on your camera. Can you hear us? I can. And... Nelson, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, yeah, my video also isn't on the camera, so. If you would like to testify without video, that'd be fine. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Sergeant Sarah Nelson. Um, I am the Sergeant of the Asphalt Program. I'm here to ask for the team of the students that we uh, help with. Um, school year. Um, some of the things right. that Sergeant Nelson, we cannot understand what you're saying. It's quite garbled. The wonders of technology. Is that better? Can you, can you tell me that? You have, you have to get it. You to go off. Is right. Yeah, is it sure. working now? We heard, is it working now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, my, uh, my background, I'm Sergeant Nelson with the Casper Police Department. I'm the sergeant over the SROs here in Casper. We have about 13,000 students. Um, some of the, I, start, I started this position in April of last year and immediately noticed we were having students uh, in the nurse's office that were uh, having symptoms of, of being high, um, but we were not able to really understand. It was a different type of uh, symptoms. Um, and these kids were saying that they were eating the Delta 8 products um, that they just bought at lunchtime. They walked down the street and purchased it from the hemp shop. Um, the problem with this is they eat the whole bag um, and then they pass out uh, or they're drooling, they're bombing. These are the things that we were seeing. Um, of course, you know, the nurses, they would call parents, parents would pick up the kiddos and bring them to the hospital. Uh, so, as I was doing some of this research, um, it, it goes back to the spice days, and, and I totally agree with um, all of the derivatives that will be coming out. There is a uh, Delta 10 that is coming out, um, as well as a Delta 11. Again, it's just going to keep um, uh, changing the isomers to make it legal. I had an SRO go into one of our head shops here, and they basically said, this is how they screwed around the law with the products. They sell by using other Delta variants, chemicals to make THC to the legal amount. So they're just under the legal amount of about 0.27 is what we're seeing. Um, but the problem is, is that, you know, these kids are not just eating the serving of one, they're eating the whole package, um, essentially overdosing. Um, I just had one yesterday. Um, we 
here at SRL Kids Academy is a 14 year old that uh, had um, eight uh, of these, and he said that he had been, he doesn't feel like he's in his own body, and this was a month and a half ago when he first came this. And so um, he is still having an effect of shy. Um, it has never stopped, and he's paranoid, delusional, and this is just from this product. There are 14 states that have made it illegal, and that is the, the, the deltas, um, mostly the delta eight. Um, and I do have a couple of things. I think somebody asked about the New York. Um, basically, Delta 8 uh, THC is banned in New York. The state revised its regulations in May of 21, making it illegal to make cannabis cannabis products created through isomerization, such as Delta 8, Delta 10, Delta 11, THC. I didn't print out the whole thing. But I've read all of these um, states um, that have banned Delta 8 products, um, and they have included all the other uh, synthetic isomers with that. Um, I also work with our uh, single point of entry in our host diversion office. I'm also their supervisor. And so I'm involved in the actual penalization of these kiddos. Um, tobacco, alcohol, uh, possession charges. And you know, how Casper is set up, um, and I'm, I'm sure that other cities are similar, is all tickets go to one single point of entry. Um, once that happens, if it's a first time offense, um, they usually will go to an educational class, such as um, the substance abuse classes, um, if it's a continued offense, then they would go into what we call student court. Um, we use diversion, then student court. Um, and student court is like drug court for adults, obviously. So there is a progression there, but we have repeat offenders that don't come in at first. Um, the kiddos that go through this and they go through the class and say, I'm not doing that again, we never see those kids again. It's a very small percent that end up going through all the way to a student court situation. Um, but again, that is probation. That's what these kids really need um, structure or someone checking in on so they're not using um, so we're, Sergeant, we're on a fairly tight time schedule. Um, if you could just wrap it up, I'd appreciate it, please. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much what I had. I just think that we are seeing this. I uh, appreciate the bill. I just do think that we need to, um, CBD is natural. Um, but all of these synthetic um, isomers are what we are dealing with here at this point. Thank you for your testimony. Does anybody have any questions for the sergeant? Thank you. Nobody's got a question. All right. Ryan, are, are you good? I believe there's another option. Okay. Briefly. Uh, we have a Richard Jones with his hand up. Is that who you're referring to? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, we have we have quite a few. Uh, can you start letting them in uh, so we can get lined up to get going? Yep. So I'll start with Mr. Jones because he has his hand up. Um, and then we also have Three? Deb White and Kelly Joyce online. Oh, two minutes. Okay. For everybody online, we're going to keep your comments down to two minutes, and um, I'll keep track of the time. So when they get in, and thank you, Byron, we appreciate your thoughts and your questions. Go ahead, Mr. Jones. Good afternoon, Chairman Northrop and committee members. I really appreciate the time on this. Uh, I sent you all a week or so ago individually uh, on the committee and all the sponsors of this bill, a document basically analyzing this bill, answering a lot of the questions that have been brought up. I hope some of you were able to read it. Uh, this bill seems to be a well-intentioned attempt to address a problem. Uh, the problem is there has been a loophole in the uh, Federal Farm Bill Act and the Wyoming Hemp Act and the industry has taken advantage of this to manufacture product which by all intents and purposes the legislature in the past and others have not wanted to uh, 
uh, have in Wyoming. Uh, the uh, definitions are extremely important, as we know. Uh, I stand in support of the concept of this bill in general, but I don't stand in support of the bill as it's written. It has flawed definitions and flawed concepts in it. I'll address the first one that uh, there's this concept that CBD somehow is legal in the state of Wyoming. It's not legal, illegal to possess, but it is illegal to sell and use. The FDA is very strong on that. They just had an announcement yesterday that the FDA will not introduce any rulemaking to allow CBDs to be sold as an ingestible product anywhere in the United States. 30 seconds left. 30 seconds? Yes, sir. Well, gentlemen, basically, this is pretty simple. CBD is already illegal to sell here. Uh, THC is not correctly used in the definitions. They keep talking about uh, the cannabidiol, which is CBD, but tetrahydrocannabinoids are the whole entire concept of THC products. The THC products are the psychoactive ones and the isomers. We need an absolute change in the definitions in the bill. Uh, CBD by itself is not as much of an issue as products made from CBD and theoretically exempt under the Wyoming Farm Bill, which if you read the law, it is not. And they're specifically prohibited under uh, the Controlled Substances Act 3571011 that says that tetrahydrocannabinols, which is THC, synthetic equivalents of which contained in the plant are illegal. This is item 21 under that Wyoming statute concerning substances. So it's already le illegal under statute and we need to enforce some of the laws that we are here. But this bill as it stands needs serious revision or rewiring. Thank you. And I'd urge you to I'd urge you to read the materials I sent y'all. We have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Next. I've brought Deb White into the room. So Ms. White, whenever you are ready. Go ahead, Deb. Hello. Okay. I will be super quick. So I'm the program sponsor of Cody Youth for Justice, and I taught science at Cody High School for 28 years. Uh, my basic take is that obviously we need to change the wording a little bit to synthetic isomers, but the whole idea of this, it's designed to protect kids. I mean, I taught for long enough to know that the basic, the perception kids have, and it was the same with spice and huffing and bath salts and all the other things over the years. If it's not illegal, kids assume it's safe because they think that we're going to protect them to some extent. Uh, and I think that is really kind of a key point. Most kids wouldn't do this if it was illegal. There will still be there will still be kids who try, but most wouldn't. Um, I also really appreciate that this bill returns local control. Um, Wyoming Statute 11-51-102B pr currently prohibits municipalities from regulating hemp and hemp products in any way. And so, when my Youth for Justice kids went to the Cody City Council, the Cody City Council completely supported them, but could not do anything about it. Um, I do also think that it's really, it's really important to understand that this is not about marijuana. I mean, this is a lot more dangerous than marijuana. I mean, and states that have legalized marijuana have banned Delta-8 and Delta-8 type products. We just have to keep our kids safe. 30 seconds. I'm all done. <laughs> I can talk fast when I have to. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. You guys have any questions for Deb? Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> you do? <laughs> Sandy, did you have a question? Um, no, I thought I'd let, I think there was one more person online. I think, I think there's a couple of people online. Uh, we just have Kelly Joyce and I have just let them into the room. Great. We're from Cody Youth for Justice and we each have a uh, part to talk about. So, um, hi, I'm Kristen Boyson and I was just going to talk about there is currently no age restrictions regarding the purchase of any kind of products, including Delta 8. So, currently, elementary schoolers are able to go out, buy, and smoke this product legally. And there are smoke shops um, within walking distance of like all of our schools. And so it is really easy to access and students aren't doing anything wrong when they're smoking this. So it's hard to prevent them. 
Hi, I'm Emily Radikoff, and this bill prohibits the sale, purchase, or um, holding of Delta 8 or any other chemically modified versions of hemp, and it would just bump the age up to 21. So there would be fines for each offense, 250 for first, 500 for second, 750 for the third, and that's all within 24 months, and that's only for adults. Uh, for minors, it would be $50 fine, and you can replace that for an hour of community service per $10, and it will be expunged in nine months. Um, so Delta 8, we don't really know much about it because it is not FDA regulated, um, but we do know it causes, in our schools, cause confusion, anxiety, and loss of consciousness. Consciousness. One of the worst things that's caused in our school is one kid went into a coma-like state and then cannot be woken up until he proceeds to get to the ER. It's a very scary drug and because it's used with, it's made with chemicals, it's unclear how it will affect different people. Yeah, and so this bill will make smokable hemp consistent with cigarette laws. So just raising the age to 21 so it's consistent um, with the other laws and reg regulations. Um, and like I said before, there's 21 states that have restrictions and regulations on this, on like Delta 8, that have legalized marijuana. And so it's it's so much bigger than marijuana and it's something that is harming us and we need to, it would uh, be good to get a handle on it. Um, and this and this doesn't include like the topicals like we brought up before. It's specifically like the consumption of it. And they have been smoking. Okay. Uh, I'm, Michelle Montalvo. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you have more comments? We do. Just one. Just go ahead. All right. I'm Michelle Montalvo Hernandez, and tying back to, Chris, to Kristen's. Sorry. So tying back to um, the smoke shops between within walking distance, we have two smoke shops here. They're around three to five blocks from the high school, and then we also have another walking distance one from the middle school and I would like to know also that there is no age limit so uh, I mean like kids from the middle school can still buy this it is vastly dangerous to have it not just here but for the kids who are that young and able to get it um also with that it has serious effects like we stated before there are ER, there have been at least six ER visits this very year that we've had here at the Cody High School. So it's just, it's not a good thing to have. We agree. You guys rock. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Do we have anybody else in the Zoom world? Would anybody else like to comment? All right, we'll close public comment. Committee, what is your pleasure on the bill? I have a question. Oh, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, we have kids in our schools and our in our communities using this stuff in the wrong way. Are we going to affect the parents that are helping their kids to use this stuff? Uh, I guess in the right way. Is that well? Is it going to? Is it going to hurt those those people as well? That's my question. Anybody okay. address that question? We could we could address that question here, or and not work the next bill, or we can address that question on the floor on committee as a whole. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. What's the pleasure of the committee, or do you have a comment? What's the pleasure of the committee on the bill? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You... Mr. Chairman, um, I think this is a really important topic. I met with a number of these kids when they came from the uh, Cody, and uh, it's it's refreshing to see him so passionate about it, but I, I'm just not sure this is ready to be as effective as it needs to be for those kids. 
And so I guess I'd like to see us work on it. Um, maybe not right now is not the time, but and do it well, because I think it is an important topic and an important bill. Uh, and um, it's definitely an interim subject. This is whether or not we proceed with the bill. I, I, my view is that we heard enough today, Mr. Chairman, to um, uh, make me concerned that pulling all that together and really making this bill as good as it can be on a very important topic, I just wonder if we have that ability. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I'd like to move that we table this bill for more discussion here to really work it. You have to set a time, indefinitely or tomorrow. Saturday. Saturday. In, we'll be in, indefinitely for the for the interim. Okay. I'll second. Right. Second. We have a motion on the floor to, and it's non-debatable to table the bill indefinitely. Been moved and seconded. Moved by Berger. Seconded by. I'm going to give it to Provenza. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. 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 Two no's. All right. We've been definitely. Thank you, Sandy. We're going to make Chairman, this. Chairman Northrup, thank you. And thank you, committee. And um, if you would take this to the interim, that would be great. Thanks you so much. It. It'll be one of our subjects. It's a big, big lift. There's a lot to learn. Thank you. All right. All right, what's it? Is it? Okay, so we're going to take up House Bill 140. Representative Zorin, sir, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Anything members of the committee. Order. Happy to present House Bill 140 to you today, even though it deals with uh, health care and insurance and mental health. It came to education, but certainly happy to appear before you because there is a huge need for mental health care in our state, primarily for our children, uh, which is, I think, maybe why it came to this committee today. Uh, basically, it's a really simple bill. Uh, I have some expert people here to testify in favor of it. Um, but at a very simple level, there's a new model out there called the collaborative care model. And we just have to put it in the uh, mandated insurance coverage code there in 262702 to um, be able to provide correct billing. And it's a lot more complicated than that, but I have a bunch of people here who were wanting to testify. So basically we're putting the collaborative care model there at the bottom of page two, line 17 through 20 into the insurance code so we can bill for it correctly and get more mental health services to our children. I'd be happy to play cleanup after you have um, some expert people testify on the bill. That sounds like a great idea. I know that some people have traveled and some people have taken time off work. So we'd like to have all those professionals and anybody from the department that would like to comment. So we'll go department first. If nobody from the department, then we'll go to the professionals. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a committee members, Jeff Rude, the insurance commissioner, we're neutral on the bill. Uh, it's not a mandate, so there will be no defrayal of costs by the state that's built into the bill. But I'm happy to answer questions. We really didn't have any much in the way of substantive comments. So I'll just sit back here with the rest and let the rest go forward. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Okay. Load chairs up. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Sheila Bush with the Wyoming Medical Society and also today, Wyoming Association of Psychiatric Physicians. We feel like this is a really important bill. It's a simple bill. Uh, and it basically allows a pathway for physicians to bill a code for team-based collaborative care. And so what I mean by that, and these physicians to my right will give you a lot more detail, but it means we'll co-locate primary physical care with mental health. And so, uh, <laughs> so what that means is right now today, the way the process typically works is if a patient has an identified need in a primary care setting and they need a little more attention or they need psychiatric care, they get referred out. 
And so there's sometimes a waiting period associated with that. Um, the percentage of patients who are able to access that care declines. And so the intent of this bill is to co-locate that mental health care within the primary care clinic. And so the patient isn't referred out. They stay with their trusted primary care physician. They get the care that they need. Um, and we allow psychiatric consultants and that expertise to live within the primary care setting, which really serves as a force multiplier allowing that site one psychiatric physician to be leveraged across all of the primary care physicians in a clinic. And so with that, I can stay up here for questions, but I'd love to defer this time to our physicians. Please do. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Chairman Northam and committee. My name is Andrew Rose. I'm a pediatrician practicing here in Cheyenne at the Cheyenne Children's Clinic. Um, and I'm the current leader of the Wyoming Check chapter of uh, the Academy of Pediatrics as well. Um, but so first of all, thank you for um, listening today. The importance of this issue, I don't think can be overstated at all. Um, we here in the state of Wyoming are definitely in the midst of a um, epidemic of pediatric mental health. You guys have, I'm sure, heard and know and possibly have experienced yourselves. Um, and so I'm here as a primary care uh, pediatrician pleading for help and caring for these children. Um, these young adults are and children are suffering, and we um, it's really quite difficult in Wyoming to recruit the specialists that are needed to assist us in this fight. Um, and and really, this gives us that tool. It will allow us to do more with those few that we are able to have here. Um, and eventually, what we hope to do is to use the one or two. Um, child and adolescent psychiatrists that we do have to uh, kind of work as a hub and then myself and other primary care pediatricians and family doctors can work as the spoke and really um, create this or sort of spread this to uh, further reaches of our our spread out population um, and true and honestly these I mentioned child and adolescent psychiatrists um, JJ will go into this further but they're really they're like unicorns it's really hard to get these um, specialists here in our state. In fact, they can practice wherever they want. Um, and but and, and just to be brief, sorry, as others have said, the, this method of delivery of care has been proven. The outcomes are, um, you know, we have great, uh, you know, randomized controlled trials that prove depression rates are lower. And I think um, what what Sheila is talking about also, the effect of, cost effectiveness is important to, to mention as well. We're going to decrease use of expensive ERs of um, you know hospital stays, but more, most importantly, it will be really crucial in saving lives. You know, lower suicide rates. That's our primary. You know, I would say our sort of ultimate goal. Um, and so, th with that, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Anybody got a question for Andrew? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. My name is Jasper James Chen, JJ for short. Um, I am very, very grateful to have gone to medical school with my uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, Rose. We're both graduates of the Whammy program. Uh, we came back to Wyoming to be able to have our loans forgiven after three years of practicing here. My wife and I, um, my wife is also a Whammy graduate. She's a neurologist. Now we've been staying here for almost nine years. And so we are tremendously grateful to be part of a state that honors the retention recruitment of physicians to come back to the state because it's exceedingly difficult. Well, thank you my wife, well, thank you, sir. I'm very, very grateful. Um, my wife, if she had her choice, would have stayed um, in Seattle where you know I'm from and born and raised. I convinced her not to go back to Rock Springs at least, so, so we're here in Cheyenne, so we're very, very grateful. Um, as Representative Zvonitz already said, you know the Collaborative Care model has been around. Um, it's relatively new, as he said, but it has been around for a while. It was developed at the University of Washington. Um, and it's an incredible opportunity for collaboration between mental health providers and pediatricians and primary care physicians. In all honesty, uh, when I first started practicing at Cheyenne Regional Medical Center, um, where I'm in, currently an inpatient psychiatrist, I um, had the opportunity to work one morning or afternoon a week within the confines of neurology in the outpatient setting. Also, we had the opportunity to go to life care, um, some other uh, you know, skilled nursing home facilities to be able to kind of just go to where the patients are. And that's the simplicity of the collaborative care model. Um, as you know, there is a huge stigmatization for receiving mental uh, health services here um, nationwide as well. 
Um, when folks come to my office, they have to park their cars outside. You know, people know what we drive here. It's a really small place. And so you just want to have options where it's a little bit more discreet. If folks are just going to their pediatrician's office or their primary care physician's office, and, you know, if something is urgent enough that Dr. Rose or one of his colleagues identifies as requiring more immediate psychiatric input and evaluation, at some point we would build into the model the capability of seeing a patient right then and there instead of having them go all the way across town to another building or something to be seen. Um, furthermore, the collaborative care model allows us to have active oversight of the most acute and active patients uh, to be presented to us as the specialist in mental health. We wouldn't need to review every single person every single day, but on a maybe weekly or a monthly basis, we'd be happy to help guide the care that's already being furnished by the expert pediatricians and family physicians. The vast majority, I would say, um, of things that come initially for concerns of mental illness, such as anxiety and depression, can be safely and adequately managed and optimally managed by primary care physicians and PCPs. If you ask my patients um, who come see me, uh, either on the outpatient side or, God forbid, if they're hospitalized and they will really see me, uh, what their preference is, I would say the vast majority of them say, I would rather be seen by my primary care physician or my pediatrician. And this is what the collaborative care model really, really does. It allows an individual to stay within the medical care primary home. And that is the best and most comfortable place for an individual to receive health care. Uh, mental health is no different. Patients need to be comfortable. If at some point it is um, more increasingly difficult for my colleagues in pediatrics and primary medicine, primary care, to see a patient, they will absolutely refer this patient to me on the specialist side. They will then come to my building and then be seen at behavioral health. Um, so there's a certain category of patients that absolutely benefit from the collaborative care model. Now, we've been trying to do the collaborative care model regardless of whether we're getting paid for it or not. But I offer this as a wonderful opportunity to recruit the finest and best physicians to come here to Wyoming to practice because Wyomingites are fully deserving of that level of care. I'm happy to stand for questions. Good job. Right. Questions? Go ahead, Representative Obi Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this uh, voluntary type? coverage and insurance policies right now, or how does it work currently? Go ahead, Sheila. Mr. Chairman, Representative Obermuller, um, right now, Wyoming insurance companies are not paying for this. Medicare pays for this. Oh. Um, it was a, the, mod, the model was established in the early 2000s. CMS designated the four CPT codes that are specific to this kind of care in 2016. Um, and so we're in the process of sort of stepping into a space in which we can get all of our insurance companies and our state payers, government payers, comfortable with this model. Part of what makes it so different is currently medicine bills based on one provider billing a code, a CPT code, and then being reimbursed for that. And the way this model works is an entire team of providers, so psychology, psychiatry, primary care physicians, work as a team and they bill the number of minutes that the entire team wraps around a patient. And so the, the insurance company reimburses based on the number of minutes that the team spends treating and providing care to the patient. And so it's really moving away from what medicine calls fee for service, which is what today's world basically looks like, into a value based care um, team based service. And it really is what the evidence supports being the way the future will look. Um, it's how patients get well faster. It saves a great deal of money in the long run. Um, and so we've worked through the interim with Blue Cross Blue Shield specifically, um, kind of making sure that everyone's comfortable with this very small step forward. And I think we'll continue to see other small steps. It's not a huge step. Um, and right now we we're at a very comfortable place where we don't have opposition from those payers, which we really appreciate. Thank you very much. Further questions? Representative Brown, go ahead. I don't have a question, Mr. Chairman. I just need to apologize to Ms. Bush because as she was testifying, I was busy dodging a light that was coming down off of a badge back here and blinding me. And I feel really bad because I think she was very concerned why I was dodging her. So my apologies, Ms. Bush. Yep. You see what we have to put up. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. I thought you were trying to not make eye contact with me. And I <laughs> okay. Any, so other... <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? Representative Provenza, go ahead. Just a comment. Um, please don't leave. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Stay in the state. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else want to go ahead? 
I'm just still trying, Mr. Chairman. I'm still, still trying you. to get my head around. So the uh, so the pushback uh, when we get this to the floor, assuming it goes there, is the fiscal note, and it costs money. So explain that part of it to us, so we know what we're talking about. Mr. You Chairman, Representative Obermuller, there is no fiscal note. It doesn't cost us money. Um, there is no state appropriation associated with this bill. Employee health insurance account. <clears throat> oh, I see, uh, Mr. Chairman, the employee health insurance account. Oh. There is a fiscal note attached to our bill that talks about a couple million dollars. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Obermuller, it was my understanding that this wouldn't have a fiscal note because our state employee group insurance is a self insured plan. And self insured plans, it was my understanding, aren't governed by state law. They're governed by ERISA. And this wouldn't be a mandate under ERISA. That's federally funded, that's federally guided. Um, so there may be some confusion. I'm not sure. Um, I also have a lot of questions. I, I was told that this wouldn't impact our state employee group plan um, because it's not a mandate. It, it affects groups, 51 employees and more, also not those on the exchange. But if it's a self-insured plan, which it's my understanding, the state of Wyoming's group insurance is a self-insured plan, they're governed under ERISA. Okay, well, it looks like this, Mr. Chairman, ahead, I think up. it's something that we'll have to follow up on with we someone will. else that will explain this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for anybody at the rise on the hot seat? Nobody? Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Please do. Load her up again and let's have the comments. We... Uh, have third reading bills in seven minutes, so we'd like to be there. We still have one. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I'm Josh Hannes with the Wyoming Hospital Association. I'll be very, very brief. Uh, we do um, stand in support of this bill for all the reasons stated by the Medical Society and the physicians that were here. Um, we have two hospitals ready to go, Cheyenne Regional Medical Center, as you heard. Also, our facility in Star Valley uh, is excited about this and, and ready to stand up these models. I would also say in, in, a, in a different part of my life, I serve as the board chair for a federally qualified health center. I spoke with uh, our executive director. This is a model that's of interest to them as well, and they would be um, willing to look into it if this should go forward. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody got a question? Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Cindy Delancey. I'm the president of the Wyoming Business Alliance, and uh, I too stand in support uh, on behalf of my members of House Bill 140. Um, as many of you know, and unfortunately, uh, you know, I, ha I have to continually remind everyone of this, but why, right now, Wyoming is number one in the country for our suicide rate. We must do better. We must do better. And uh, in business, people are our most important asset. And uh, this bill to my members makes really good sense, knowing that mental health conditions are impacting one in five adults. Uh, these conditions impact performance, productivity, and retention, and more. So um, I think all the reasons have been stated. It's a pretty hard act to follow with our, our two fine uh, medical professionals. So I'll just leave you uh, with the, that the business community stands in strong support of this as another tool in our toolbox to try to um, help our people be at their best. Thank you. Questions for Cindy? Thank you, Cindy. Anybody else? Load chairs up, keep them loaded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Andy Somerville, Executive Director for the Wyoming Association of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Centers. Uh, we also come here to brief, just briefly say that we su strongly support this bill. Uh, this bill is the first step in what will probably be a longer discussion over the next couple of years about a collaborative care or integrative care model. Your community mental health centers are currently uh, embarking on the journey of getting certified community behavioral health centers up and off the ground. Integrated collaborative care is is what those centers do so that we are connecting mental health services with physical health services as has been discussed why this is so important i won't go over that again all of our provider types our psychologists our counselors um, our psychiatrists our all of our prescribers are strongly in support of this model and we would ask you to please vote yes and pass the bill thank you thank you questions anybody please go ahead lindsay 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Lindsay Simino with the Wyoming Counseling Association. The Wyoming Counseling Association also stands in support of this bill. We recognize that it is going to eliminate barriers when it comes to medication management for our clients, and we're very excited to see it move forward. So we do ask for your support this day. Um, I will not repeat what has already been said, but very much we echo in support of what has already been said today, and I stand for question. Questions? Anybody on the committee? Thank you, Lindsay. Anybody else want to comment? Anybody else want to comment? All right, we'll close public comments and work the bill real quickly. Representative Wanitzer, would you like to come up? Committee, do you have any amendments? Oh, first off, Move what is, thank you. Second. Moved by Provenza, seconded by Berger. All right, you guys have any Thing you'd like to change any amendments on page one? We're going to do this quickly. Page two. Page three. Page four. Besides the fiscal note, does anybody have any questions? Question. Question on the bill. Question on the bill. We'll proceed to vote. Representative Andrew. Aye. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Connolly. Oh, you got oh, Connolly. Whoops. Yeah, I, say, I, have I have an old one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Connolly. <laughs> sorry. I'll do. I'll do differently. Um, sorry. Representative Allred. Aye. Jeez. Representative Andrew. Aye. Representative Berger. Aye. Representative Brown. That sounds better. Aye. Representative Clauston. Representative Lolly. I have an aye as a proxy vote. Okay. Representative Obermuller. Aye. Representative Provenza. Aye. Chairman Northrop. Aye. That's nine ayes. Very good. Thank you, Representative. I'm sorry, Chairman Zwanitzer. Sir. Thank you, committee. And uh, it's been a long time since a fiscal note came out of nowhere that was never sent to me and put on the bill. And I will figure out what's going on, what's going on. And I don't believe it to be correct. So 